This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. So on behalf of the uh, Graduate Council of the Academic Senate, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you today to the first of two Hitchcock lectures to be given by Dr. Robert Lucky. The Hitchcock professorship is one of the earliest endowments at the University of California at Berkeley. It was developed from a bequest of property made in 1885 by Dr. Charles M. Hitchcock, a San Francisco physician with a long interest in education. As stated in his will, the purpose of his bequest was to establish a professorship at the University of California for the purpose of giving free lectures on scientific and practical subjects. The fund was allowed to accumulate until 1909 when the Hitchcock lectures were instituted with the inaugural lecture by the distinguished chemist from the University of Chicago, Julius Stieglitz. The university received an additional gift in 1930 from Dr. Hitchcock's daughter, Mrs. Lillian, uh, Lily Hitchcock Coit, best known as the donator of funds to build Coit Tower in San Francisco. Mrs. Coit directed that the professorship made possible by this enlarged endowment be designated the Charles M. and Martha Hitchcock Professorship in memory of her parents. The great extent to which this endowment has enabled the faculty staff and students of the university, and the general public as well, to become closely acquainted with distinguished scholars from throughout the academic world, is evident by the list in your programs of those who have served as Hitchcock lecturers and Hitchcock professors. We are proud to see the long tradition of the Hitchcock professorship so eminently upheld by the stat scholar of the stature of Dr. Lucky. In his capacity as Corporate Vice President of Applied Research at Belcor, Dr. Lucky has played and continues to play a key role in the development of the internet, the World Wide Web, and other artifacts of the information revolution. A, revolu a revolution which is having a profound effect on the ways in which modern societies function and evolve. He is best known for his invention of the adaptive equalizer, a technique for correcting distortion in telephone signals, which is used in all high-speed data transmission today. Born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Lucky attended Purdue University, where he received a BS degree in electrical engineering in 1957, an MS and PhD degrees in 1959 and 1961. After graduation, he joined AT&T Bell Laboratories, where he was initially involved in studying ways of sending digital information over telephone lines. In 1987, Lucky received the prestigious Marconi Prize for his contributions to data communications. He has also been awarded the Edison Medal of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering and the Distinguished Civilian Contributions Medal of the US Air Force. Without further delay, I am pleased to present to you Dr. Lucky, whose lecture topic is Failed Visions and Unexpected Adaptations, Reflections on the Interactions of Society and Communications Technology. Bob, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for coming. I always worry that someday I'll show up to give a talk and nobody will be there. And, uh, I'll be greatly embarrassed, so thank you for saving me from embarrassment. I'm going um, to talk today about uh, the sociology and marketing of telecommunications services. And as you've heard, I'm an engineer, so I don't know anything about these things. 
Um, but I don't feel too bad about being here talking about them because uh, nobody else knows anything about these things either. And the industry has lost billions of dollars proving that there are no experts at this kind of thing. So um, failed visions and unexpected adaptations. Uh, I, you know, I, I sometimes think and I'm ashamed of what my industry, the visions that my industry has had. Um, and it hits me sometimes when I go home. My, my parents still live in Pittsburgh where I grew up. And as you go in the front door, you see my father's telephone. Um, this model came out in 1940. It was when he got it as a brand new telephone. And I usually, when I go home and I said, Dad, why don't you get a new telephone? And he says, what for? They don't do anything different. Like, you've wasted your career, son. <laughs> and for a long time, I thought, this is right. They don't do anything different. Um, but now, suddenly, with all the connectivity we have with the web, which I'll, I'll talk somewhat about later, uh, I feel that things have dramatically changed and maybe my father's telephone no longer is so, so relevant and so up to date as it has been for 50, for 50 years. Get that? Thanks, Lafay. Now, during uh, my career, the uh, telecommunications industry has been uh, propelled by three visions. From about 1965 through, from 19, about 1960 through 1975, the vision was picture phone. More, I'm going to say more about that. From about 1975 to about 1985, it was going to be home information systems. And then it started about 1985, it was video on demand. These are the three things that drove the investment and all the thinking about telecommunications. And they were all wrong. Now, let's talk first a little bit about picture phone, and I'm not going to go into such detail on some of the others, but picture phone came out in 1964, and um, you see a picture here of picture phone. It, um, I actually had one for a while. I had one on my desk, and I used it for about a year. Uh, and then uh, one day, I think I had the last one in the world. And <laughs> And there was nobody to call. Uh, and then they came and took it away, and that was, that was it, you know. <laughs> now, the Bell System spent a great deal of money in the development of this. I actually took a course at Bell Labs in uh, innovation, and we studied the perfect development, and it was picture phone. <laughs> you know, maybe from an engineering standpoint, this was the perfect development, but nobody wanted it when it got out. Now you see in the inset is a picture of the uh, video telephone 2500 that AT&T and British Telephone brought out about 1992. And I think they gave up on those too. Uh, so again, you know, they keep trying to resurrect the, the idea that people should have video telephony. And it's such an easy vision, you know, because it's a natural extrapolation from audio that people should want video. And uh, more about that as we go along. Now, when I was at uh, the Bell Labs when we first brought this out, and uh, I remember particularly the, the studies which were done by the math department uh, predicting the, uh, the acceptance of this product. And they said that basically the picture phone follows the same mathematics as the plague that, you, think about it now for a minute. Now, you don't want to be the first person in your neighborhood to get the plague, you know? But once a lot of your friends get it, you know, you're interested in it now. <laughs> and so what happens is things start out very slowly, and then they, and then they kind of take off. And so that, they predicted it would start slowly and then take off, and actually they were half right. <laughs> Now, nowadays, we, we put a name to this law. It's called Metcalf's Law for Bob Metcalf, who, who I'm jealous of uh, having named, um, a terrible name as it is, 3Com Stadium. Um, as a matter of fact, he told me the next, next company he starts is going to call it Candlestick Systems. <laughs> 
But anyway, Metcalfe's law is that the value of a network application grows to the square of the number of users. Now, why is that? Because like one picture phone is useless. There's nobody to talk to. As soon as there's another person, it requires some value. And as more people go on, get on, the number of pairwise connections is n times n minus 1 over 2. And then maybe you count it both directions and take away the over 2 stuff. But as you can see, it grows as a square, the number of users. So you get a curve that comes up and then, and then kind of takes off. But the implications of this is very hard to get anything started. Because you don't want to be the first person to buy something that requires other people to have it. And again and again, this law has defeated the telecommunications community. Um, now, the other law that we always uh, don't take enough cognizance of is the law that you know very well, Moore's Law, that really drives everything. And it, this is incredible to me because, as we all know, Moore's Law is not a physical law of all, at all. You know, it's just an observation. It seems to be an economic and social law. but, but it's very hard for us to have an intuitive feeling for things that go exponentially. And again and again, I and others mistake how quickly that technology gets so, so good. Uh, I, I gave a talk about two years ago at Kodak. And uh, the digital cameras were just first starting to come, come, come out. And I was really interested. I went around to talk to a bunch of friends and said, what business is Kodak in? And the most common answer I got was the chemical business. Now, other people said memories and stuff like that. But it's kind of worrisome if you're sitting in Kodak and you see the camera coming. So I talked to the Kodak people and they say, oh, well, you know, these cameras, they're expensive and the resolution is poor. We don't have to worry about it. But you got to think about Moore's Law and what happens. I was there trying to sell digital switching to the Bell Labs in, a, in 1976. We had a prototype digital switch. And they said, anything you can do with a digital switch, we can do with an analog switch. And we're cheaper. We can make these relays for pennies. And they were right. But again, Moore's Law said that if you extrapolated, in only about three or four years, the digital was going to be cheaper. And they missed out on that. And again and again, those two laws govern all these kinds of things. Now, as you, Picture Phone has had, um, uh, you know, a life of its own in terms of video conferencing and other things. And it, it always baffles me, the, the sociology and the psychology of video conferencing. Incidentally, at Bell Labs, for several decades, we had a, a psychology research department, which was really pretty good good. And they did good work, but one day the big boss said, you know, these people never made any money for us. Get rid of them. And so they did. Uh, now later they got rid of the economists for the same reason and stuff like that. But it's very frustrating that they, uh, that when you look for answers to the kinds of things, why is video conferencing not better? How do people really use it? Now, one of the um, significant breakthroughs was done by my company, Belcor, when they came up with the idea of a video wall. And uh, this is a picture of uh, video wall conferencing. I have this uh, facility across from my office, although basically nobody uses it today. But um, in, in this kind of a thing, the, the people in the video are life size. And it gives you a kind of a bonding that doesn't happen when they're on a little screen in front of you. And it's kind of interesting. I got a uh, paper sent to me out of the blue by some uh, MD uh, who had done some work on this kind of thing and claimed that he, he looked at the, uh, at the um, acceptability of video conferencing as a function of the size of the, the picture. And he said it reached the maximum when it was life size. And then as it got bigger than you, you know, <laughs> the acceptability went down. You know, I mean, he didn't like being, you know, talking to this, uh, to this big, to this big thing. Um, it's funny that that many uh, studies of video conferencing, which have been done, have shown that that um, the thing that's most wrong with video telephony is poor audio. And that, that audio is the most important thing. Good stereo imaging and good quality audio. And if you improve the audio, people think the picture is better. Uh, and it happens again and again. And yet, uh, all the work, of course, is in video algorithms and coding and all that kind of thing to get higher resolution. But and the, good audio is very, very hard to do. 
uh, and there've been many proposals as to you know who gets the microphone, when does it switch, who you know, and directional mics, who does it go in on, you know, and the trouble is all these things get in the way of the meeting. And I know many of us have done video conference meetings, and it just isn't like being there. I had a, uh, I, I had a dinner once in London, and uh, the Minister of Commerce uh, came up to me, Lord somebody or other, and uh, just out of the blue he said, uh, you know, video conferencing will never work. And, and I don't think I said anything. And he, and he grabbed me all of a sudden, and he embraced me, and he says, I, I need to smell the person I'm dealing with. <laughs> So I'm, you know, really worried if my deodorant failed or, you know, whatever. But, you know, I thought about it a lot afterwards. I don't think I said anything at the time. I just don't know what to say. You know how it is. And you think afterwards the clever things that you ought to have said, <laughs> you know, but you can't think about it at the time. But, uh, you know, if you're an engineer like me, you immediately say, you know, he needs a smell board. <laughs> you know, let's go design a smell board. You know, but that's not it at all, of course. He means this is a metaphor for something more than just a sterile electronic image. That some, there's something else there. I got an email from someone just a couple of days ago saying that studies have shown that 60% of the communication is nonverbal through body language and all that kind of thing. And that may or may not be true. I don't dispute it. But whatever it is, it isn't coming through on the video. For whatever reason, people find it a lot less acceptable. Another thing that's bad here is there's no eye contact. You don't look directly at the person, and the person looks directly at you. There are some systems that try to take care of that, but most of them don't. Don't. I didn't like my picture phone uh, for a number of reasons, but one of them was that it demanded my attention. You know, when the picture phone rang, you, you know, usually when you answer a phone, you know, you can doodle and stuff like that and talk to the person at the same time. Nowadays, people try to type very quietly, you know, and you say, I heard you typing, you know. <laughs> you know? But the point is, it does, it does, the phone doesn't take all your attention. And the picture phone, you have to really stare stupidly at this person and give them all your attention. And, I, you know, I don't want to do that, particularly because the person who usually called me was my boss. Uh, <laughs> Video conferencing uh, it creates a we and a them. You know, you can't help but the fact that there are two locations and there's us, the smart people on this end, and them, the dumb people on the other end. And there was a, an article in Scientific American oh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, that was very interesting. And they did experiments on different kinds of conferencing. And what they did was they had a garbage cart assembly. It's one of these things you buy at the, the uh, hardware store and it comes with a whole bunch of loose parts and some tissue instructions that are incomprehensible, you know, as to assembly, you know, and then the box says some assembly required, you know. Uh, so anyway, what they did was they gave one person a set of parts and the other person the instructions. And then they gave them a regular telephone in one experiment, another experiment they gave them a teletype, another experiment they gave me a video conference link, and in another experiment they, they made them face to face. And the incredible result of that experiment was it didn't make any difference at all. Uh, so that it's generally thought that for information type tasks, that video just doesn't seem to add anything. But there is a lot of work that indicates that when you want to change people's mind, when you want to lie about something, uh, when you want to resolve a conflict, things like that, that video does, does uh, get, uh, change the dynamics of the meeting. Uh, I was going to say helps, but that's not always the case. It just changes the dynamics one way or the other. Okay, so much for the first vision, picture phone. Um, the, uh, the next two visions that propelled the industry through the last two decades, uh, both can be sort of exemplified by this picture. The first was home information systems, and uh, uh, there were a good many, uh, several cable companies, AT&T and others, that lost a good deal of money in trials trying to prove that people would want to get information on their tele television screen provided by a service bureau. And then in recent years, the great vision of all the industry was video on demand. And that's what this ad is from, British Telecom. The idea that anybody could sit in their living room and order any movie at any time, and everybody will be happy. And this is going to put, pay for putting a fiber into every home. And, uh, it's, and the great model here was the video rental industry. I you know, figure if, if, if the video rental stores can proliferate the way they have, this is a good business to be in. 
And so that, and that was going to pay for the broadband infrastructure in America. And all of the executives of the industry went around talking about it. Now it's a completely deflated vision anymore. There was an article yesterday in the New York Times about yet another company, uh, I think it's called Intervision, that is going to bring video on demand to the internet. And uh, I thought the comments were kind of funny from executives. They, they uh, interviewed in other industries and they said, hey, been there, done that, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, and there are lots of problems. One is that, as you know, the movies really aren't available uh, in the food chain of movie distribution. And uh, basically, the systems that we have today, which are near video on demand, pay-per-view, uh, pretty much fill the demand that there is. So it's maybe not, not a great thing. So the question is, why do we go wrong in all these visions? Why can you not predict what people are going to to uh, take up and pay for. What do people want? And I, I really don't know an answer to this. In fact, my personal opinion for what it's worth, and it's not worth very much at all, is that, that these evolve out of kind of a social chaos. And that a little blip one way or another could change the way society adapts to some of these things. And, and that some of these things just aren't predictable. But the, the things that people have done are go ask experts. And the experts say they will want video on demand. Um, <laughs> now, I heard a, a, Gordon Bell's a good friend of mine that uh, now works for Microsoft, designed the VAX computers at DEC. But he's espoused a law that I think is really great. So I'm trying to give it a little publicity. I'll call it Bell's Law. But Gordon says, if you're going to predict what the average person is going to do, then you better be pretty damn sure you're an average person. <laughs> And uh, this is why sometimes asking the experts what people are going to do is really a bad idea. <laughs> now, another thing is they go out and do surveys. And this is this has never produced anything useful I know about. Then they ask focus groups. And focus groups are very good for tweaking things that already exist. They seem to be very bad for asking people about what they might have in the future. And finally, there are the expensive trials that the industry has lost a, a fortune on to, through the years. And I um, don't really understand the purpose of some of these trials. But for example, AT&T did a trial of home information systems in Coral Gate Florida uh, in the late 70s. And in that trial, uh, they, uh, they were providing information about uh, oh, movies and transportation and news and weather and sports and all that kind of stuff uh, on, the, on the home television set over a telephone line. And they, they selected participants from the Coral Gables area who were uh, the early adopter type of people, high income, high technical kind of people. They gave them an extra TV set, they gave them an extra phone line, and they gave them the service for free for three months, and then they asked them how they liked it. And unsurprisingly, they said they liked it. Uh, now, uh, I thought this was very poor design and experiment. And so I accosted the manager in charge of this, and I said, you know, this, this is not going to give you accurate information. These people feel singled out. They feel like, you know, they've been elevated in stature. And of course they're going to tell you they like it. You know, they don't have to pay for anything. There's no competition for the telephone or for the television set or anything like that. And I'll never forget the manager said to me, and he stuck his finger in my face. He says, lucky you don't understand. The purpose of this trial is not to fail. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, this might have been funny, but, you know, there's some truth to this. And the truth is a lot of these trials, the Warner Cube system, even the trials today, uh, such as they are going on, are designed not to fail. They're designed to prove a political thing rather than to get any true demographic information about the market that might or might not exist for whatever it is. Now, as a technologist, we eschew all these uh, predictions of the market, and we believe in, in the field of dreams approach, you know? We just go out and we say, if we build it, they will come. Now, the problem is that you have a clash between the engineering mentality that says, if we had broadband to the homes, people would do great stuff with it. I don't know what they'd do. 
but they would do great stuff if you're willing to invest to bring broadband to the home. And the business people say, show me the business case, prove me how I get return on my investment. And you have a diametric clash between the field of dreams approach and the business case for things that don't exist and, and you cannot really quantify them. And so you get stuck in no man's land where nothing happens and to a great degree that's, that's what, what happens. Now I've often uh, thought about, you know, the ultimate goals of communication. If I had, if I had, a, um, if I had a, a perfect telephone, you know, what would it be? What is the ultimate dream? And I, once I wrote this down as to, you know, what the sort of the ancient dreams are, and uh, just being sort of quickly, um, we want to be somewhere we are not. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I sometimes think of how seldom I'm where I really want to be. If my mind weren't mostly occupied giving this talk, I would want to be someplace else. You know, right now. I'm sure many people in the audience are thinking, geez, I wish I were someplace else, you know. <laughs> you know? I saw you looking at your watch there, like, <laughs> you know. I, it's funny how seldom we are really where we want to be. And the pur purpose of the telephone is a primitive way of telepresence of taking you somewhere else. And perhaps we could be a lot better at that. And I'll come back to some of the other dreams in a minute. But, um, but th this idea of telepresence has always interests me. You know, how, how realistically could we project our presence somewhere else? And somebody sent me years ago a little book called Watts Fable. And it sort of uh, interests me. I, I lost it. I don't know where it is anymore, but I remember it pretty well. And it said that uh, in, uh, back in the dawn of civilization, uh, man painted pictures on, on, the, on, on the inside of caves to show the gods the animals that he wanted to kill. And they tried to make the animals sort of realistic so the gods could know, you know, what, which animal it was they wanted to, to kill. Um, now this evolved to art, and art went through a, a period where it wasn't really very, very realistic. We all know the paintings where you don't have perspective and that, that kind of thing, and perspective was a later invention. And then we reached a seminal point in the development of art history, according to this book, which is, after all, a fable. But there is an element of truth to this, to this event. And it was about 1609, something like that. And King Henry VIII was temporarily between wives, an awkward situation uh, for him. And he asked his advisor, Thomas Cromwell, to recommend a marriage. And Cromwell uh, then suggested that Anne of Cleves over in France would be an ideal maid, uh, politically speaking. And Henry, at the bore that he was, says, yes, but is she attractive? And uh, so this being a day before airplanes and photography and all that kind of thing, they dispatched the uh, painter Holbein, and this all is true, by the way, to France to paint a picture of Anne of Cleves and bring it back to show Henry uh, whether Anne of Cleves was attractive or not so that he would know to marry her. So Holbein came back with the, the portrait, and King Henry agreed to marry, uh, to marry Anne. And then when he met her on the beach, it's alleged that he said that he was deceived by Holbein and that, uh, that, that she was not at all attractive and that, that he henceforth decreed that all art would be realistic. You know? <laughs> Here is um, Holbein's painting, which hangs in the Louvre of uh, Anne of Cleves. Um, I, I found also uh, an x-ray uh, view of, uh, underneath this, and it said this is much worse of her. Uh, so, you know, maybe Holbein did, Holbein actually was known for his uh, <laughs> veracity. Uh, thanks, I guess I should maybe just hand these to you and we'd save the middleman here. <laughs> uh, but, but even so, um, this, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't look like he, he, he should have been deceived too much. But, um, but anyway, so they, they went on from there. So art became quite realistic, according to Watts' fable. Uh, and, and people said then, yeah, but you know, it's not totally realistic. We need something better. And so they invented photography. And then they said, you know, but you know, it's black and white and you know, there's colors in the real world. So they made it into color. And they said, yeah, but you know, it doesn't move. So they made movies, and then they said, yeah, it needs to be in color now, and we need sound, sound, there's sound out there. So they made it widescreen and color and sound, and people said, yeah, but you know, it doesn't have depth. 
so they made it 3D. And then they said, yeah, but you know, it's there and I'm here and I don't interact with it. So then they put in sensors and, you know, and they detected your movements and they changed the scene according to how you moved. And people said, yeah, but it's still, it's not like being there. And so in the end, they wired stuff into your brain and stimulated directly, you know? <laughs> and then I, there was one page left in the book and I turned it over and it said, and how do you know this didn't happen many years ago? <laughs> and that you're not where you think you are now. <laughs> So, um, the telephone is but a poor thing of telepresence, but of course, as you know, we're working on virtual reality and the idea of projecting our, our presence some, somewhere else. And um, who knows how that'll all go. But we also want to be some time we are not. You know, we wish the days go by, we wish we were in last year or next year or whatever. And, um, Telecommunications has always been synchronous in the past, you know. You talk to a person in real time, and it's only recently that uh, we've discovered the beauties of being asynchronous. And um, in, in terms of email and fax and pagers and surrogates and answering machines, you know, the world is turning to a, a, an asynchronous world where you don't have to deal in real time with the other person. So time displacement is really a, a very important thing here. Uh, and I wrestle very uneasily with the dynamics of synchronous, synchronicity and non-synchronicity. Uh, and I feel that I'm working in an interrupt mode. I know a lot of people in the audience have pages and stuff like that. And I get pushed down the interrupt stack, you know. I'm doing something, I get interrupted by, by telephone or email or page and I start doing something else and then I'm interrupted again and I'm interrupted again and pretty soon, you know, my stack overflows, you know, and I, and I, I don't know, I, and I never do anything. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And more and more the world seems to be, to be that way. And it's the purpose of communication somehow to adjudicate that. And we have not reached a perfect resolution of that. Now, I'm not going to really dwell on, these, uh, uh, on the next one, but it seems to me that one of the, the driving forces is that, we, that th there's a great desire to be someone that we are not. And of all the, all the magazines, I once asked a, um, a magazine publisher, you know, what is the most successful magazine startup? And he says, no question, over the last century, People Magazine. You know, the idea of, you know, and all the celebration of celebrity and so forth, the fact that Clinton can get all the headlines with some ridiculous exploit, you know, it just, it, it never ceases to, ama to amaze me, the, the, the way we want to displace ourselves. And uh, finally, we want to be something we were not. We want to be more than just ourselves. And that's where I think the web comes in and, um, and has changed the world dramatically. And let's talk a little bit about that for the rest of the day. Now, one of the principles that bothers me a lot here in, in all these things is the dilemma of reciprocity. Now, reciprocity in, in communications. I used to think that the best thing that I wanted was a wireless wristwatch Dick Tracy telephone. And I could call anyone in the world from my telephone. Until one day, I thought, then anybody can call me. <laughs> and you can't have it both ways. You really can't. Because if you decide, I'm going to opt out, I only want to call from this, then other people who can't call you have lost the ability. Their wristwatch phone becomes kind of worthless as far as you're concerned because they can't get you. So there's reciprocity built into this. Now, uh, in, um, and this, um, it's an uneasy kind of situation. So when I had a picture phone, it used to be my boss that called me all the time. Now, there's a privacy switch on the picture phone. You could turn off the picture. People always used to be worried whether they'd get me out of the shower or something, which is, you know, never really was a problem. But the thing was, after living with a picture phone for about two years, I never once threw the privacy switch. Because you couldn't. They would say, what is he trying to hide? You know? You couldn't. You were compelled to do it. So I was compelled to watch my boss and he me when we did these kinds of things. And I thought, what I want on my phone is a presence dial. And, you know, when a salesman calls, I want to turn the presence down. You know? When I talk to my children, I want to turn it up. I want them life-size and real and you know, video and all that kind of stuff. But you know, depending on who you're talking to, but it's not the same at both ends. 
the boss wants to see me, I don't want to see him. You know, he, you know so that, that it's, it's an uneasy adjudication of what capabilities that you have at both ends, and there's no right answer to that kind of thing. So reciprocity here is a difficult thing, and I, I even today, uh, often when I hold meetings and someone says, you know, I can't make your meeting, can I dial in? And I really hesitate. I don't want them to do that because it interferes with the main meeting. You know, everyone ends up talking into the microphone. You know, this is absurd. Uh, but uh, that's, the way it, that's the way it works. Now, wristwatch phones are coming. Uh, you know, I saw this uh, ad uh, just the other day. Uh, you know, it is a vision, this Dick Tracy thing, and now we get pager, pager wristwatches, and uh, pretty soon there will be uh, web-accessed wristwatches, and you know, who knows, all that kind of stuff. Um, but intimacy directly with, uh, with communication. Now let's talk about the web because it's really interesting. Where did the web come from? Not from my industry with its pathetic view of the future. You know, the, the web was foisted upon the industry and it defied Metcalfe's law. Now remember Metcalfe's law is that the value of the network goes to the square of the number of users so nothing can get started because it's useless to have. If you had the first browser, it's useless because there's nothing to browse, see? So how did this ever take off? And the key to me here that was at first it gets distrib distributed electronically, but moreover, it was free. It was free. And therefore, the cost equals the value when it started. It was worthless but free. <laughs> You know? So I downloaded one of the early Mosaic browsers. Nothing to browse. You could just go to NCSA homepage and that was it, you know. Um, but, uh, but it was cute and it was free. And so all of a sudden what you have is you have ignition because price equals value. I guarantee you actually that you could get picture phone star today if you mailed a free picture phone to everybody. You know, but there's no economic model that allows you to do that. But maybe when internet becomes uh, capable, when everybody has a has a camera, you know, built into their PC, this is going to happen soon. And then you're able to distribute the software for video telephony and so forth. That people will suddenly adopt it because again, it will be free on the existing platform that is out there, and it can defy then Metcalfe's law and take off too. Now. Uh, out there on the web is changing the sociology of communications day by day and, and I watch it and I marvel at it and we all do and uh, you could have talks for many hours on what is happening. Uh, to me I divide things in information, commerce and community and I'm really not going to talk at all about commerce. Um, perhaps a, a word about, about information. Uh, just some of my concerns here. We all know that the page explosion is taking place and uh, um, I, um, you know, they did some very nice work here at Berkeley on the uh, Inktomi uh, search engine and turns into Hotbot and stuff. And, but I, I really feel that the search engines just, in my humble opinion, aren't keeping up with what's happening out there. You know, I, I get either 20,000 hits or I get zero. And I can never get 100 or 10 or whatever would be most useful. And I had a big argument about a month or so ago with a uh, professor from Cambridge who's very involved in this kind of thing. and uh, and. And I said, you know, you guys aren't cutting it with the search engines. And she said, no, it's because you're incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> and we argued all through dinner, and I don't know who's right, but, uh, but this, is, this is a really interesting problem. You know, and she, she said, look, all these search engines uh, have help pages, and it's a pathetic fact that nobody goes to them. And nobody really knows how to compose their search as well. And if you did, these are perfectly good things. It's just your incompetence that gets in the way. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm just an average user, and it doesn't work too well for me. It doesn't work as well as I, I should. I had the experience I think a lot of people have. You set out to find some bit of information, and you never find it, but you find all kinds of other interesting stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried about the accumulation of junk out there. Junk overwhelms everything. You know, 90% of everything is junk, and the law is recursive. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and and it's just it's really oh, it's just overwhelming. But I you know, and I I love libraries. I I you know, to me, wandering libraries is a great joy in life. And uh, to have a library which is open 
all the time and available at my fingertips. It's really pretty neat. I miss the smell of the books. I miss the feel of the books and stuff. But to have that and to have the infinite depth uh, that you have in, in, in the web is a fantastic thing. But it seems to me that this just isn't a library that it's a, a lot more in the library and we haven't realized its potential yet because there are people out there too and the wisdom, the common wisdom of the people. And if we could put that together somehow and slowly we're doing that, we'll achieve a tapping of the common wisdom more than just the books. You know, I'm, I once got in an argument, I uh, gave a talk at the annual meeting in the, the, um, uh, the Library of Cong Congress and, I, and I, I told them that they had too many books. Um, and this did not go over well. <laughs> you know, and they got really, uh, they really were affronted. And I was sort of surprised. And I said, look, just keep the good books upstairs, you know, and then put the rest in the basement where they don't get in the way. They're in the way. You can't find the good books because there are too many lousy books. And they say, how are we to know which are the good ones? I said, well, look, that's your problem. <laughs> yeah. But you do have data on, on who has used the books. You know? I, I was in a local university library a year or so ago, and I was looking at an old book on, on violins, actually. It was written in uh, 1906. And as I was reading this, and uh, the book had been in the library for almost 100 years, and all of a sudden I discovered that the pages have been cut in the book. Nobody had looked at that book for 100 years. It laid in the shelves, in the way. <laughs> and the librarian said, it proves our point. You finally needed that. You know? <laughs> and that's why it was there. So uh, I, I love the idea of somehow a, achieving a, a, a sharing of wisdom here. And I think that the web makes it possible. And I know many of you know about the Firefly technology where uh, you get uh, recommendations. And th they find people like you out there. And then they use the people like you to recommend other things to you. Uh, I had sort of experience before Firefly. I was getting on an airplane uh, several years ago, and uh, the person in front of me asked the stewardess uh, what movie was showing on the plane. And the uh, stewardess said, um, it's Summersby. And he said, is that any good? And she says, I don't know. I haven't seen it. And I was standing behind her. I said, it's no good at all. <laughs> and the stewardess turns and says, how do you know? And I said, I, I didn't like it, you know. And she said, let me give you a test. Did you like Enchanted April? Did you? And she goes down this list of movies. I say, yes, no, yes, no. And then finally she shakes her head and she turns to the other gentleman and she says, this man knows what he's talking about. Our movie's no good. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as many of you know, in Firefly, what you do is you give them all the movies you liked and didn't, didn't like, and the restaurants you liked and didn't like, the movies and, and the, uh, the music you liked and didn't like. And then they find other people had the same likes and dislikes as you. And then they use them to predict things that you will like or dislike. And again, it's a, it's a sharing of kinds of things. I like the idea of a connectedness. You know, we had a, uh, there was a, a technical meeting on information on the web. And there was a young graduate student from MIT, a, a woman that stood up in the back midway through the meeting and says, you people don't get this at all. This isn't about information. This is about community. Now, you don't get it. And to me, there's a kind of connectedness out there that fascinates me. Now, you all heard about six degrees of separation. Everybody separated from everybody else by six degrees. And I'm sort of wondering if with this new connectedness that this isn't becoming a little tighter. Maybe six is becoming five, whatever. And what, what effect does that have on the dynamics of social interactions on Earth? And it's very interesting. Now, there's, a, there's a little company called Planet All. It's, and I think, unfortunately, several more trying to do the same thing that wants to form the web of friendships on the, uh, on the web, uh, what they want you to do is to sign up with them and to tell them all your friends. And to tell them where you went to school, what clubs you belong to, uh, you know, what companies you work for, your travel schedule and stuff like that. And then they want to put you together with the rest of the world in various ways. They say, well, you're visiting Berkeley this week. Did you know that there's an old high school classmate of yours who's out there on the faculty? You know, uh, and then, but they can form the six degrees of separation and prove it. Just, if they know who your friends are, and they know who their friends are, 
You see, that what they want to do is form the entire association web. And they can say, if you want to get to influence Clinton, that your best path is to go to so-and-so that you know, who knows so-and-so, who knows Clinton, whatever. Um, so, I mean, the social dynamics which are being changed here are, are, are fascinating. Um, Esther Dyson, one of the, the I, these are just a few, I mean, there's so many social things that people are talking about. Esther said, conspiracy is hard, propaganda is easy, and this is really well put, you know. Conspiracy, you can find other people's like you. You can find your long-lost clones out there. It's, it's pretty easy. But you can't broadcast propaganda because there's no mechanism. So we have a totally different kind of a thing here. And then again and again, we see what's now called the Salinger effect. As you know, Pierre Salinger uh, discovered that uh, TW-800 was shot down by a US missile. And he discovered this on the web. And things <laughs> that, that things that happen on the web acquire a veracity they don't deserve, and they spread instantly throughout the world. And then they become, a, they get a truthfulness that they're not. Uh, and it has happened, uh, like I say, again and again, and we're seeing it happen uh, just uh, very recently. Uh, it's funny how these things uh, just, uh, um, they really become true. Uh, and, and we've seen it in the Clinton uh, uh, escapades uh, a number of times just, just recently. Now, some people say that all this is not good, that uh, the web is uh, destroying human connections, that, that um, I may argue that there's a greater connectivity, but uh, that actually uh, when I go and take myself to my computer terminal and, and block out the real world, that this is bad. And Neil Postman has written about this kind of thing about other technologies. And um, he says technology has an agenda. It's never neutral. You know, that, that the technology is trying to do something, for better or for worse, and that all technology is a Faustian bargain. It giveth and it taketh away. And the question is, the web is giving these things to us, but what is it taking away? And uh, just one little vignette from Postman, which I think is kind of interesting. He says that um, even writing, when it was first invented uh, was controversial. And then, in fact, Socrates, Plato thought that this was a bad idea. And this is a quotation, actually, from that. Um, and th this talks about the invention of writing. And they said, basically, that because people are able to write things, that there's a negative side to this, that you're going to lose your ability to memorize. And in those days, of course, the Iliad and the Odyssey were passed down verbally from generation to generation. People memorized the, the whole books. And we, we lost the ability to do that, of course. This discovery, writing, will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls, because they will not use their memories. They will trust the external written characters and not remember member of themselves. They will be heroes of many things and will have learned nothing. They will appear to be omniscient and will generally know nothing. They will have the show of wisdom without the reality. And I'm sure the web, when we look back on it, will do that. I once gave a talk to uh, people to people, and um, the people from many countries get together to form human associations. And I was talking about the wonders of modern television, and I could sense uh, an animosity in the audience. And I suddenly stopped and I said, how many of you, if you could go back and uninvent television, would do it? And they all raised their hands, you know, that this is bad, that there's, there are very, very negative effects there. On the internet, we get flash crowds just showing up, given places. Right now, for example, the Drudge Report, you know, was, had, had 50,000 hits a day or so, and now they're up to, you know, better part of a million hits a day because of the Clinton stuff going on. People show up. And, and, and in, in millions, we've never had this ability before, where everybody could show up one place, and then they all disappear and they go, some, go somewhere else. People are trying to change the whole nature of the web, from pull to push. And we'll see how that goes. Maybe the broadcast media will go there. Well, I, I'm kind of running out of time. There's so much that we could talk about here. So I want to talk one more thing with you, and then I will shut up for now. Um, I, I want to give you my pet invention, if I might, uh, in the way of a social thing that can be done by telecommunication. It's a, it's a great invention, which I'll give you for free. Now, um, and it comes from the idea that I'm fascinated with of it, ubiquitous embedded cameras on the net. 
live cameras. They are springing up thousands and thousands of them out there right now. And I will just, you can get them, Yahoo has a listing, and there, there are several amateurs that keep giant listings of these things. And you can get live pictures of the traffic uh, here and uh, of, of the surf and, uh, you know, the skiing and, and uh, uh, people's pets and all that kind of stuff. And, and there are cameras hanging in all kinds of places. Uh, here's uh, Oxford Circus in London at rush hour. Um, sun's rising in Mount Fuji in Japan. Um, the beach in Rio, cameras out there checking these things out. Um, people praying late at night, the Western Wall in Jerusalem. And then there are interior cameras. There's a, several museum cams where you can watch people in the museum for whatever reason that you might want to do. Um, there are bar cams. Here's a bar cam in, in Ireland where you, know, you can watch the people at the bar, and it's pretty boring. Um, and then there are people who put cameras for some ungodly reason in their living room. And you, know, you can just sort of tune on in the living room and see what they're doing. And uh, I don't know why. Uh, I showed this to my daughter and sort of, you know, she's like, I can't believe this. We're looking at these people's living room, you know? I don't know. And then there are people that hang these in their office. Uh, and there's Don, whoever he is, working in his office. And I watched him work for a while and I thought, Jesus, this is boring, you know? <laughs> And then uh, there's Steve Mann at MIT who for some years, several years, wore a head cam. And uh, you can tune, tune in on Steve. I think he's just given it up recently. And on a recent uh, trip up to the Media Lab, uh, I saw him sitting on the sofa without his apparatus and, and my host was saying, gee, I didn't even recognize him, you know, because everybody at MIT has gotten used to seeing him walk around with his camera on his head. And you could just sort of download live pictures of what he was seeing and doing. And it was pretty, pretty boring again. <laughs> Pretty stupid. So uh, now for my great invention, I thought I got a camera. And, and by the way, cameras are going to be really, really cheap and ubiquitous. You know, I've seen cameras that are the size of a button, have built-in wireless internet access, and that, that have potential going for five dollars. So that you know everything can be online, and you realize you could get to a place where all the world is sort of stitched together with with live cameras. Now, so I have a camera, and I thought, what do I want to see? And my first idea was to put it in my uh, backyard and focus it on my house, so that when I'm on a trip like this, I could download a live picture and see if my house is still there. You know, <laughs> you know? and it gave me a sort of a feeling of uh, you know confidence. Um, you know, like when you're driving home and the fire engine's coming the other way, you know, a little, little worried about this. Um, and then I thought, well, no, better I, I put it in my front hall and focus it where my dog sits. And I could see if my dog is okay, and that would be kind of neat. And then I came up with my great idea, and basically it's a dog cam. <laughs> So that, so that what I do is I download a picture of whatever my dog is seeing, you know. And I thought, why stop there, you know? Pass a law, all dogs have to have one of these. And then you integrate it with GPS. And then, if, and then if anything is happening anywhere in the world, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, a robbery, you know, whatever, you find the nearest dog, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and get a live picture. That's my great invention. It's all yours if you want to do it. Uh, one last view graph. Uh, appropriate at a place like Berkeley, but I think appropriate any, any place, you know. The governmental quandary with all this stuff. Um, when I go to Washington, you get off the plane at Washington National Airport. Now I guess it's Reagan Airport, you know, for better or for worse. And when you get off there, you, you, you suddenly feel this urge to control everything. You know, it just happens when you walk off the plane. And the, what, the, what the net is largely doing to government is, you know, the worst fate of any, of any entity is irrelevance. And that is the sort of thing that, that's happening. Uh, now, I think there are a good couple of good things that they might do, define universal service and get it into education they're doing it, but they are vexed by these terrible issues that, that, in my opinion, they've been on the wrong side of in censorship, taxation, cryptography, and, and copyright, which I'm sure many of you heard a lot about all the stuff going down on that and what a giant mess it is as government figures out how to control this thing that's getting out of their, 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 their purview. So, as you can see, 
the failed visions of the industry and the giant social trends that are happening in spite of the in industry. Thanks very much for your attention. Am I supposed to take questions? Yes, for a while. For a while, okay. Well, not too long, because I know people want to get away. Yes? Big Brother is watching this for sure, but you're very modest in, in that uh, the internet, the fiber optics are all there for use for developing further right now. And it wasn't a failure. It's a great success in how fast fiber optics Oh, absolutely. You know, the, the technology is a, is a great success. And fiber optics has brought the capability to the world. And that should not take away at all from that. No, the capability, it's what gets overlaid on that. That's the important thing. But the failure of one of these visions, video on demand, has prohibited the fibers from getting to the home because that was the way it was going to be done. Yes? Okay, so DSL, failed vision? No. Vision or will it I think it'll happen, Jeff, but uh, uh, we'll see. I, I think it'll happen because what's happening is the computer industry is going to push it. And as you've seen, they, they said the telco industry has just been slothful on this. And, and I know because I've dealt a lot with them. And, and they have other priorities. They're being torn apart by, the, by competition and so forth. And they say, we, they, we don't even know if we can make money out of this, so we don't want to do it. And the computer industry said recently, you guys got to get, got to get off your duff. You know, we're doing great things with computers, and you, you're the bottleneck. And so I think they'll force it on it. And the other thing about cable modems, and I'm going to talk about this Thursday, so I don't want to go into it now, but, but cable modems are the, are the arch enemy of DSL. And so they're going to make DSL happen just because it's an arch enemy they have to beat. Yes? Yes, on the video phone, are you able to see the other party when he answers the phone or when his um, phone is? Yeah, when he answers the phone, you see it, yeah. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer, yes. Me? Yes. Yeah, I was wondering about the implications for the, you know, the 4 billion people who don't have this technology. They haven't gone through the stages like, you know, the U.S. has done and stuff like that. Well, you probably thinking of, like, you know, um, you know, all the countries that go straight to selling or, or, or maybe uh, geophysics or something like that. Yeah, I, I'm fairly bullish about uh, these four billion people getting service one way or another. Uh, it's a very nice article by John Perry Barlow in the Wired magazine about Africa that, last month. Uh, Africa, Wired, you know. Uh, it, it's coming a lot faster. And the young people of the world, and a lot of those four billion are young people, take very well to this kind of thing. And in the U.S., the model is to have a uh, personal PC in your home. And other people can't afford it, but to get community kiosks. And there's a different culture that's arising in some of these places around it. And I do think that wireless will get ubiquitous and cheap uh, for access. So I, I really think that uh, it'll, it'll happen uh, you know, faster. Of course, California leads the world by far. Other questions? Yes. Oh, <laughs> well, actually, that's part of my question. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, um, but I'm wondering, as you spoke, if, there, if you believe, is there um, something arising out of this idea of connectedness that might take us not against or alternatively, but to another sort of more balancing model than competition, which, um, you know, right now the internet and so on is still bound up with uh, business and even universities, excuse me, but there is a little bit of competition um, when you deal with university. Um, is it taking us to a model of collaboration um, that may be, you know, may balance this whole thing out in some way, sociologically. That's a very interesting point. I've never thought about that. But uh, there is in the internet, in its original form, a real spirit of cooperation. You know, people put stuff on for free. And I, I really get a kick out of it because the free stuff washes out the commercial stuff. They can't charge for stuff because there's too much free stuff. And there's that real spirit about it. So you may, you may be right. But in industry, of course, competition has just gotten worse and worse. I so it's going the that, other way. But the notion of collaborative creativity and collaborative um, learning that's arising out of this. Yeah. Uh, this There's even a little company that they, uh, they create music uh, uh, jam sessions uh, on, on the net with musicians in different cities. And, and um, 
it, uh, of course, like anything else, one of the difficult things is who owns the intellectual property when they create good music, you know? And in the end, uh, and particularly difficult because they had uh, bots, robots that do some of the soundtracks you know, with, with them. And the trouble is, does the bot own its own, you know, uh, its own soundtrack kind of a thing? I have, you know, this. And so they come up with a bill of rights for bots. Yeah. Okay, let's go back here. If you were a venture capitalist and somebody came to you with a video phone coming at you today, what would it have to look like for you to actually fund it? I wouldn't fund it at all. <laughs> There's nothing having to do with the concept at this point. Uh, you know, to me, this is just, I'm just too cynical about this right now. I mean, it is, people have been tried it and tried it and tried it and tried it. And I just don't think that, that people really, I don't know. I think the only known use of it is for grandparents to see the grandchildren. And, and that, that they're only sold in pairs, and that all the ads you've ever seen for this show the, grand, the grandparents seeing the, the, the grandchild. And that, because that's the only known use. <laughs> yes? Uh, you speak optimistically about the technologies like Firefly, where people have access to each other's uh, experience. Do you think that has negative effects in that it might homogenize cultures and uh, absolutely? And Absolutely, I've heard that argued. That's a very interesting point. That you 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 homogenize cultures through this way you know, by reinforcing the, the central uh, here. You, you really do. And the, the other thing about the net, you see, is that that you don't tend to find divergent opinions because people find other people like themselves, and then they share the same opinion with themselves. I heard one of Clinton's uh, principal advisors complain that if there's a dissenting opinion uh, that isn't found by a search engine for example, then it doesn't exist. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and this is a real problem because, because of the fact that conspiracy is easy. You can find other people like yourself. You tend to gravitate to other people like yourself and not to mix with people that are not like yourself. And that's that, absolutely true and it's a very excellent point. Yes? So why was the telephone successful? It's only good in pairs. You need critical mass. Could just as easily communicate with somebody else by writing letters? Oh. Don't forget that the telephone took almost 75 years to wire the country. It did not happen overnight. What about fax machine? I'm sorry. The fax machine took almost 40 years. To, it, it, absolutely. It was invented more than 40 years ago, and it took a long, long time because, again, it was useless to have a fax machine when no one else had it. And a number of factors combined to, to push it over the critical point. There's a critical threshold that if you get enough of them out, it really takes off, and it took, a, took decades to get to that point. Standardization helped. The cost going down in technology helped. The, the globalization of business helped because the fax was ideal for that. There got quite enough breakthroughs in algorithms that, that permitted it to you know, be more efficient. So lots of things happened. Yes? One of the Japanese experience with um, video I don't think it's much different, but you know, I, I, I really don't know. They don't have picture phone either, but as we do know that they have a different kind of a close-knit community there, and, and uh, so that we would expect to see different social dynamics, but I just simply don't know, other than they don't have it. Yes? Uh, with all these scale of visions, uh, what is your vision of where the, where the sparks of evolution and technological advance will come from? And what will drive those? I, I decide to get out of the vision business. <laughs> I mean, I'm really serious. Every, we are so wrong every time that why, why bother? You know, why pretend that we know? So it'll be a random process? I really think it is. And, I, and, and I'll tell you, I, I saw a very interesting quote from an executive of one of the telephone companies. He said, the problem today is that the mean time between surprises is less than the mean time between decisions. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, thank you very much. Oh, okay. <laughs>